Then suddenly it happened. Fire. The kind we've been hearing about. We didn't want to see trees burn, of course. But if a fire had to happen, we've been hoping it would do it while we were around. And now, here it is. The fellows in the power wagon lose no time. They come rushing up to the fire, and by the time they're within range, the power pump is working, and the actual fight begins. Quite a fight for a while. A sudden wind caught the grass flames, and we wondered if we shouldn't radio for more help. But before long, the fire is under control, and once again, the power wagon has won. There were no restrictions or geographical limitations to our trip. So when word reaches us that power wagons are being used up north in the blizzard-swept areas for hauling feed to stranded cattle, we decide to leave the southern sunshine and hurry north to record that chapter. During the Wyoming-Nebraska blizzards of 49, we knew power wagons had been used extensively to reach starving cattle, but we hadn't seen it. Now we are here. We can get the story firsthand. With a big snow blade hooked onto the front, we start for the cattle area. The blade gives added weight to the front wheels for traction and can also be used, of course, to clear a road when necessary. There is a two to three inch ice crust on the snow, which makes the going really rugged, especially where the snow has drifted or where we drop into deeper areas. We should have brought chains, but we push ahead and keep coming closer to where the cattle are being brought up to a spot we think we can reach. We must get to the hay too before we do the cattle. That is cached at what was felt would be a convenient spot once, so it takes us most of the day to complete our mission. But when the hay and the cattle finally meet, it is worth far more than the day's work to see the scene that follows. It takes a few minutes for the men to start spreading the hay. But when they do, the cattle begin crowding around. They follow the men like famished children. They stumble and stagger in the deep snow. The ice crust breaks under their weight, and many have hurt their legs in the effort. But the hay appears to make everything all right. Hungry animals are much like hungry human beings in their actions. And it warms us inside to watch the cattle eat. Contentment actually settles over what a few minutes ago was a wide area of cold, inhospitable snow. Contentment and a feeling of great relief. From Texas, we head west to Arizona and finally end up on one of the large farm ranches of the Salt River Valley, some 21 miles from Phoenix.
The Salt River Valley is one of the agricultural garden spots of the United States. It is famous for many products, but especially citrus fruits, melons, truck gardens, alfalfa, grains, and date palms. Irrigated from the great dams of the Salt River, the valley, once a cactus and mesquite desert, now boasts farmland prices above $1,000 per acre and worth every cent of it. Here, too, road maintenance is an important factor, and these people use a regular road grader for power wagon attachments. It keeps the roads smooth, well-packed, and well-drained. They're in top condition all the time. Back at the machine shed, they hook up their three-bottom 14-inch plow to the lift at the back end of the truck. This is always an important day on an Arizona ranch when they are ready to break open another section of virgin desert. And with the power wagon instead of the old tractor, the event has achieved somehow an added thrill. When we arrive back at the wide open section, we begin to sense the feeling Junior and his father have expressed. The first time a plow has ever broken this desert soil, and the furrow will be a full half mile long. Head straight for that needle at the west point of Superstition Mountain, we shout after Spence, and see how straight a furrow you can plow the first time. The power wagon pulls away into distance. Suddenly I remember how it used to be when I was a boy with a team of horses and a walking plow. How I'd always take pride in that first straight furrow. And how, after that, I'd walk behind that plow for 14 hours a day to plow an acre and a half of ground. They'll plow that much here in an hour without moving off that cushion seat or getting out of the cab. Down in Georgia, we saw farmers using big disc plows instead of these three bottom mold boards. There are different types of plows, of course, for different types of soil, and the power wagon pulls them all. We follow along now, getting our shots and listening to the drone of the truck motor and the desert soil scouring on the apron of the plows. sticks his head out the window and looks back. The wide ribbon of turning earth falls behind the three plows. This is the good earth of good America. This is the good earth of good America. How reassuring is the sound of plows in the soil instead of bombs and shells in the sky. In still another field, the soil is being prepared for seeding, and the spring tooth harrow is the implement to do the job. Pulling the harrow is little effort for the power wagon. The fields of the desert are as flat as floors, and it's possible to get over a lot of ground in one day. One of the things we've been most impressed with on the trip so far has been to see how modern farm machinery and portable motor power takes only hours to do jobs which used to take days. Many farmers own more than one power wagon and work them together as Spence and Junior are doing here. This way they can prepare and see big acreages in the time it used to take for one small field. Here, Spence refills the cedar. He's planting barley grown mostly for feed in this area. This is one of the best things about the power wagon, he says. We can carry our seed grain right along with the drill, and it doesn't take any time to refill the hoppers when they get empty. And that's just another way the power wagon saves time and money on the farm. You carry your working materials, seed, tools, and supplies right along with you as you go. And when you want them, they're there. 
three or four minutes here, and the feeder is on its way again. As the hours pass, the pile of full sacks disappear, and the empty sacks pile up. Alfalfa is one of the money crops in the Salt River Valley. The abundant yield gives the farmer an important income after his own feed requirements are provided for. An average of six cuttings in a season is common, and it isn't unusual to harvest even a seventh. Here, Spence and Junior load up the power wagon and the trailer. The bales weigh 60 to 70 pounds each. And when the men finally quit, 122 bales are aboard. That makes the power wagon something of a hauling unit, don't you think? This western country is not called the wide open spaces for nothing. And farmers must have dependable economical trucks for fast transportation. That's where the power wagon fits. Power where you need it, with eight speeds forward in four wheel drive. Speed where you need it, on the open highway, in conventional two wheel drive. And here the load comes, out of the barn, toward the highway. And here it comes, in from the desert, in past the citrus orchard, and in over the canals toward town. When the West was young, and ranches the size of empires were being encircled with barbed wire, one of the cowboys' most important jobs was that of riding fence. In those days, patrolling the fence line was a solitary, hard, day-to-day -day business, and the fence rider's best friend was his pony. Well, horses are still useful on a ranch, but mechanical progress has made them obsolete on fence patrol. With this power wagon, Spence and Junior cover many times the amount of fence a man on horseback could possibly do, and they carry the posts, wire, and tools to make repairs right with them. Sand, rocks, mesquite, all difficult for a horse and completely impassable for an ordinary truck, offer no obstacle at all to the power wagon. Here is a place where the fence is down. A post is missing. The power wagon pulls up, stops, the men get out, and Spence cleans out the hole with a shovel while Junior brings a post from the truck bed. In a matter of three minutes, the repair is underway. Most fence trouble is caused by loose posts, so Junior tamps the dirt in solid. And Spence finally gets around to stapling the wires. In seven or eight minutes, the repair is completed. And the men pick up their tools, get back in the truck, and proceed on their way. There are many miles to cover before sundown. Cactus, brush, and thorns are just something to get around or over with as little effort as possible. The men never bother about cactus thorns in the tires. They just keep right on going as if the thorns were not there. Just as they do, incidentally, to the dry washes and the royals.
Time was when the rancher's wife was too busy to enjoy many of the little comforts of living. Running a family, helping with the chores, preparing the meals, there was little time for anything but work. But times have changed. The rancher's wife today is closer to the rest of the world. With town only paid by car where it used to be days or at least hours, the modern rancher's wife lacks few of the advantages of her city sister. Automobiles, the movies, telephones, television, radio, all have made her world smaller and more pleasant. This young rancher's wife is going to town for groceries. And because it's handy, and because Junior has gone over in the other valley with a passenger car, she's taking the power wagon. It's very comfortable, and there's plenty of room in the cab for everybody, including her friend, a neighbor from an adjoining ranch, and the children, not to mention the kitten. A little while ago, we saw this truck being used as a tractor, then as a hauling truck with four tons of hay aboard, then as a carry-all for fence patrol, and here it is again, the same truck, only this time it is a family car, so easy to drive that it's a pleasure for the rancher's wife to use it for a shopping trip to town. We call that versatility. Perhaps you have some other word for it. And here they are at the grocery store. She swings easily into a parking space. This isn't like the old days, but after all, it shouldn't be. This is the middle of the 20th century, and we can expect more machines that'll do more things and serve in more ways and save more money than ever before in our history. This is progress, and the power wagon typifies progress. One of the most important of Mr. Allen's activities has to do with rattlesnakes. They grow big and venomous down here, and rattlers are milked daily at the Institute to obtain poison for the making of life-saving antivenom. It is one of the very sober aspects of Mr. Allen's work. Here we join him and his crew as they go out in this power wagon to hunt snake specimens. This promises to stir the pulse a little. The power wagon was made for country like this. Rough ground, no roads, small trees, tall brush, all meadows higher than the truck. The vehicle is right at home when the going is tough. And we are glad to be aboard here, too. If this is snake country, we wouldn't want to be walking back to Silver Springs through this stuff. When we arrive in this likely looking area, Ross tells the driver to stop the wagon and the men get out. This is where the hunt begins. And the men, with their special hoop sacks and their strike-proof boots, begin wading through the brushy growth. This is it.
Some hours later, at the check-in shack, we ask Ross to let us see in detail the milking process. He agrees. We don't know if you'll sleep or not after watching it, but here it is. For a while, he teases the snake on the ground. He says he knows when it will strike, so he raises his foot just on chance the strike might come higher than the top of his boot. This is just under the knee. The boot itself is specially made so a snake's fangs cannot penetrate it. As he picks up the snake, we wonder for a moment if he's going to lose it. That snake is heavy and almost as long as Ross is tall. And then the milking. Those fangs are a full inch long and just like hypodermic needles. Pressure on the poison sacs just back on the snake's throat forces the venom out. It actually squirts. That fellow was really loaded. But somebody's life will be saved anyway. Antivenom is a godsend in the snake country. We have traveled a lot of miles and seen a lot of things since we left Detroit. The swamps of Florida, the pine forests of Mississippi, the blizzards of Minnesota, the plains of Texas, the blue skies of Arizona, and the floods of the greatest river in North America. We've shown you only that which we ourselves have seen. How a single truck born in the desperation of war is now changing, helping, serving, and improving the lives of people for whom it works. Here it is helping, and here help is genuinely, deeply needed. There is humble pride in the faces of the men who make and plan this car in Detroit, a satisfaction in the knowledge that something which they turn out with their own hands and brains can touch and serve the lives of people as this unit does. The car is built to work in difficult places, to do many jobs well, to make possible easier, fuller, and more secure living to bring economical power to people for their own use, and to offer assurance and dependability to those same people when they must call upon some mechanical thing to furnish for them the dependability so urgently requisite when safety is at stake. So, whether it is to fight fire in the pine forests of this good land of America, to bring relief to starving cattle in the snows and blizzards of the freezing north, to carry people to safety from their lonely and flood-ravaged homes along the Mississippi, or whether it is the more ordinary path of serving on the farms, ranches, and rural reaches of America, the power wagon is built to serve. We believe you can count upon it where the need is great, the going tough, and the better living of people, the goal toward which you strive. Uh -huh.